Hi, everyone. Um, I'd really like to welcome you to this webinar um, on quantifying modeling and mitigating process emissions. Um, I'm Amanda Lake. I'm a process lead with Jacobs. I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, although I'm hosting this from Slovakia, uh, where my partner's family are from. So really excited to be here. Um, this is the first in a series of four masterclasses on process emissions. Uh, we're doing one a month, except, except in July when, when we can all be on holidays. Um, and we're really excited to bring you, um, bring you today the first of these masterclasses and also um, to launch an Iowa book on the topic, um, quantification and modeling of fugitive greenhouse gas emissions from urban water systems. So we're here today with a panel, which includes two of the guest editors of the book, um, two co-authors of the book, and a, a special guest water utility um, who's taking action on process emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So good to know that the book has been published um, by the Iowa Task Group on Greenhouse Gas Modelling. And this masterclass series has been brought to you by the Iowa Climate Smart Utilities Group. So the Iowa Climate Smart Utilities Group is a platform for knowledge exchange and it has two key topic areas um, and some active subgroups. I'm the lead of one of those subgroups on greenhouse gas monitoring. Um, but if you're an Iowa member, please consider joining the community of practice and also joining the activities of the subgroups. And next slide, thanks. So just a bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, the webinar will be recorded and made available to, to everyone freely. Um, and that will be on the Iowa website. Um, I think that's all we need to say there. Next one, please. Um, if you've got questions, please raise them via the Q&A box. So we're going to have, um, we're going to hear from our four panellists to start with, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end. Um, and so if you've got questions along the way, we will try to answer them, but please um, don't raise them via the chat, raise them using the QA box and the instructions on how to do that are there. If you've got any general, um, general points or requests, please use the chat box. And next slide, please. So um, just, we've got a great agenda today. We've got um, four speakers. And so I've obviously just given an, giving an overview, doing some housekeeping. Um, we'll then hear from, um, Liu, who will give us an overview of, of the book and will actually launch the book, which was really, which is really exciting. Um, we'll hear from Ariani on um, the way we currently report process emissions. We'll then hear from um, Jose on um, some of the key issues around process emissions. And um, finally, we'll hear from the experience of um, Per Henrik uh, and VCS Denmark in terms of taking action on process emissions. We'll have the Q&A and discussion, um, and we'll also remind you of um, the upcoming webinars at the end. And we've got a few polls to do as well. So next slide, please. I'll, I'll introduce each of the um, panelists as we go. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the five of us on the call today. And um, we'll, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll get started with um, just two polls. So next slide, please. And we'll leave these polls open until the end and we'll um, capture them in the, um, yeah, in the discussion. So we're just trying to find out where folks work um, and um, what action that you're currently taking on process emissions. Um, I'm guessing you're here because you know how important these emissions of nitrous oxide and methane are um, in terms of the water sector and, um, and are probably well aware of, of the criticality of us taking action on these. And perhaps you're also aware that we actually have much of the information, if not all, um, that we need to be able to take action on these. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for being here and for your interest in the topic. And just finally, next slide, please. Um, we are keen to um, uh, share and like and tag on social media. So if you if you do this, um, please do, do tag us um, and tell us what action you're taking on greenhouse gas emission reduction. And next slide, please. And so finally, I uh, just would like to um, introduce our first, um, our first panelist. So I'd, re I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Liu Ye, um, who's a wastewater expert and the Greenhouse Gas Research Program Leader from the University of Queensland in Australia. Her research focuses on sustainable and cost-effective water and wastewater treatment, and she's an established, she has an established national and international leadership in the research field of understanding modelling and mitigating fugitive greenhouse gas emissions from urban wastewater systems. 
Her research outcomes not only offer long-term cost-effective solutions for water utilities to reduce emissions, but also inform the development of new policies. She's the editor-in-chief of the new book that we're launching today, Quantification and Modelling of Fugitive Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Urban Water Systems. And with that, I'm um, really excited to hand across to Liu. Thanks very much, Liu. Thanks for the introduction, Amanda. Okay, so before I um, give an overview uh, for the fugitive uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the urban water system, um, I will take this opportunity um, to do an official launch of the GH book. So um, this book is about the quantification modeling of the fugitive greenhouse gas emissions from urban water systems. And uh, um, the book is just available today. For some of you, I think it's available yesterday. And uh, uh, this is a fully open access book and you can download uh, just directly from the link I provided here. Um, so on behalf of the editor team, uh, we also, so except myself, we also have um, Jose Poro. Uh, later on, Jose will speak a few words and we also have uh, Ingmar uh, Nopens, so as the editors. Um, so first, I think I would like to, um, on behalf of the editor team, to express our appreciation for the 33 co-authors that contributed to the 11 chapters of this book. Um, we really spent nearly three years to get this book published. And uh, in the meantime, I also would like to thank um, all the reviewers who reviewed the chapters for us, provided their valuable uh, comments and feedbacks. Um, also, in the, main, uh, in the meantime, I want to thank the IWAGG task group um, also to provide um, the initial actions and support uh, for us to generate this, to generate this book. Okay, um, Jose, do you want to turn on your camera and speak a few words? Yes. Um, if it wasn't so early for me, I would maybe have a champagne glass to help commemorate the, the occasion. Uh, just also want to thank the, the contributors, um, <clears throat> well, the co-authors and the editors, you, Liu, and Ingmar. Uh, the, the task group members, as, as Liu mentioned, uh, it was because of their early work in helping to coordinate and direct the research uh, that, that really started in 2009 and 2010 that helped us to get to this point. And I'm glad, I'm glad we started back then because if we were starting now, uh, I think we would be in trouble. Uh, so I think also want to thank IWA for all of their support through the whole task group timeline and support through the development of the book. And I think, it, I think it's a testament to what IWA can do in connecting people because we really had the, the best of the best working on this. So big thank you to IWA as well. Thanks, Jose. All right, um, after we launch the book, uh, I will start to give an overview of the process emissions from the urban water system. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse moving. Um, so in terms of urban water systems, I did put um, a few systems together. So starting from the storage system, also with the water supply systems, and then it supplied the water to the household. Then after we use the water, um, so all the sewage was discharged uh, into the sewers. So we have the collections, thousands of kilometers sewer pipelines, collect all the wastewater and transport them into the wastewater treatment plant. And after we treat the wastewater and then we discharge the treated water into the receiving water bodies, including rivers, estuaries, space. So you can see that in the whole urban water cycles, um, all of this may potentially be contributed to the greenhouse gas emissions. But for the book and also for my today's topic that will be focused on the sewage collection and treatment system. The reason is majority of our pollutants are actually treated here. And then that means the two potent greenhouse gas, one is called nitrous oxide N2O, another one is methane, is also majority is contributed from these two systems. So for nitrous oxide, it is a greenhouse gas um, uh, with a green, uh, global warming potential between 260 to nearly 300 times as CO2. And the uh, methane is around between 25 to 30 times um, stronger global warming potential as CO2. 
Um, we also have some CO2 emissions. But the CO2 emissions normally will be regarded, majority is indirect emissions through the energy usage, uh, like when we burn fossil fuels to use this, um, uh, to generate CO2. If you use the green energy, then basically it is not uh, counted as your CO2 emission. The other part is a direct CO2 emission. And then this part is not the biogenic CO2 uh, through the, uh, the, the, the bacteria respiration process, but it's more through the fossil related carbon. For example, uh, maybe the carbon related to when we're using personal care product uh, and a detergent, but they are actually uh, the ingredients is generated with some fossil fuels. So these probably contribute a minor percent, percentage of the total uh, process emissions. Okay, so where are these, um, the major, I will focus on methane and two So where are the GHG emissions from the urban water systems? So here I provided, um, uh, based on wastewater flow, you can see that uh, from the beginning, we have the sewage collection systems, and then that uh, I will use the orange arrows that indicate the methane generation. So along with the system, we have many places that will generate the methane. So, um, but for N2O, um, dominantly it is produced during the biological treatment unit. So nitrous oxide can be generated uh, mainly during the nitrogen removal cycle. You have denitrification, nitrification, many pathways. But the majority of the N2O generated will strip in there. But for methane, as long as you have an anaerobic environment, like during the collection system, if you have anaerobic treatment processes, anaerobic digesters, large handling system, they can all be potential sources that will produce nitrous oxide and methane. Okay, so next slide, I will show you, talk about where the detailed pathways. This is, looks quite complex and overwhelmed. So my key message is not to get you to understand the whole nitrogen cycle. So this is basically tell you the whole nitrogen cycle involved in many different types of bacteria. But the key message will be N2O is normally key gener generated by um, AOB, which is ammonia oxidation bacteria during the nitrification. And also it can be produced during the denitrification by, by the heterotrophic denitrifiers. So these two contributed a majority of the N2O emissions. And also for, um, for example, AOA, ammonia oxidation, archaea may generate some N2O. So these three are biological pathways. So biological pathway contributed more than 95% of N2O generation or more than 98. But a few other um, pa uh, pathways like the chemical reactions, direct chemical reactions may also contribute to N2O generation. So key message here is N2O can be generated by multiple bacteria pathways in different conditions. And the biological pathway is a major contributor for N2O generation. And then for methane, well, so this in methane generation pathways is four step. Well, it's basically what we use to produce biogas, right? So it's the same if you have anaerobic process, you have these four steps, and then the methanogenesis will produce biogas. That's exactly how we want to recover energy using anaerobic digester. However, this anaerobic process will also be generated in other places. For example, during the uh, sewage collection, so the first one, you can see this is a full field sewage pipes that is called rising main. So this is coming from the pumping station that we have the pumps deliver all the wastewater uh, to the next, uh, um, this wet well. Uh, and then in this rising main, you can see this, uh, the wastewater has a lot of carbon. And then on the wastewater, on the, on the um, sewage pipes, there are a lot of biofuel generated there, the growth there. So they will use the COD, the carbon there and generate methane. And then this methane is generated during transportation. When it goes to the gravity sewer, you can see, then the dissolved methane will be transformed transformed into the gas phase. That's where you can say uh, methane will be generated, will be emitted. 
And another, I put another figure, which on this side is um, a, a sludge drying lagoon. It's a, a long-term like sludge treatment systems. Uh, like in Australia, we, uh, well, just, we, we do have a lot of land. So this is a quite common uh, process, like before the, the sludge is transported out uh, from the plant, that the sludge, um, uh, after digestion, they will put all the sludge in a shallow lagoon, and then we'll top up, uh, top up some water, uh, normally from the effluent, and then we'll leave it for years. So two or three years time, you can see uh, they will, the sludge will, will keep digesting. And then we have some uh, air com coming into that will bring some transfer, gas liquid transfer, and then the generated methane will be emitted. So I give you these two um, uh, cases, tell you how methane uh, may also emitted uh, during the wastewater treatment and sludge treatment process. Um, so my next two slides is about really about accounting guidelines. How do we report uh, the GHG emissions? So um, Ariani, the next uh, speaker or panel will have a whole dedicated session on this topic. So I just want to show you a very simple. My key message here is uh, both N2 and methane, if you report them, how much you generated from your process, you need to use a fixed emission factor to calculate. So how that works is basically this emission factor, for example, N2O is defined as how much N2O um, is generated based on the nitrogen loaded into your plant. So that's all you can use a percentage, right? So that's defined as emission factor. So what I want to show you here, the emission factor is mainly currently this IPCC guideline. They gave you an emission factor. So in 2016 version, that's 0.5%. So that means you have 0.5% of your nitrogen loaded in your plant will be regarded as N2O. So you, you just use this uh, emission factor to report your N2 emission. However, in 2019, when they uh, published a refinement, so this emission factor changed to 1.6%. So you can see that no matter this is regardless of the process you are using, regardless of the uh, performance uh, uh, you are doing, but you're going to use a fixed factor. Mm. And then similar for methane, it's also using a uh, emission factor, but then the good thing is the emission factor, so basically it's really based on uh, the, the technology that you are using. So I will not go through the details of the table. I think my key point here is actually uh, uh, one of the major sources that we identified is the methane generation during the collection, the flowing sewer system. The, basically in IPCC, they said, uh, this is it is insignificant significant amount of methane so this is not regarded as a source of methane which based on the research and quantification study that has been proved it is not true okay um so the next slide i'll move to some general quantification methodology that we have been used to quantify full-scale uh, greenhouse gas emissions so the first one is called the tracer gas um, dispersion method so for this method basically you're relying on a mobile so this one is a mobile vehicles that carries some measurement uh, equipment and say um, this one is the, the plant so this shows a Google map, how this plant uh, layout looks like. So what you do is uh, on, this, uh, on these lines that you start to have some tracer gas um, cylinders. And then once you start, you release this tracer gas. You can say it's basically the wind will blow the tracer gas into a direction. So if you draw your mobile and measuring all these um, gases you captured, right? So analyzer basically can measure the tracer gas, can measure n can measure methane. And then based on the dilution factor of your tracer gas, you can also calculate, based on the measurement concentration of CO2 and n you can also calculate how much is generated from the plant. So this is one way, it's basically on the whole plant uh, quantification that you measure both n and methane. Uh, the other way very commonly used is called the floating hood method. So you can see this is a little uh, like a chambers of hoods that will float uh, on your um, uh, wastewater treatment plant. And this hood will capture the emitted 
will capture all the flux, all the gas. So basically by measuring the flow rate under the hood and also measure the concentration of methane N2O, you can capture the flux of methane N2 emission under this uh, covered hood area. And uh, basically, basically you have to need to have a faith that this covered area is representative uh, to the whole, to the whatever size, and then you apply uh, the size of the covered area, then you get the total uh, methane on to emission from these zones. So this method also quantify both methane and n two uh, The third one is a micro sensor base. So this one is mainly to measure dissolved n two that is generated during your treatment plant. So by using this, you also need to know which is um, a KLA, which is a volumetric transfer coefficient of n two O. Uh, so currently, um, I think if you use this sensor, the software will give you a calculation. So you need to use an empirical equation and estimate the KLA and based on the dissolved N2O concentration that you calculate uh, the total N2O emissions. Uh, in terms of methane specifically, um, here I put on the, uh, the methane emission of the uh, silver quantification. So based on, so still I separated into rising methane and gravity silver. For rising methane, because it's all dissolved methane, right? There's no gas phase. So what you do is you measure uh, three sampling points that you can say you measure dissolved methane here, dissolved methane here, and also after, so methane basically transferred into the gas phase. And then overall, you can say, okay, all this loose in the dissolved methane, you can say that's the emitted methane in the gas phase. However, once we move to the gravity server, it's more complex because both gas and liquid that is happening, you have methane generation, you also have a methane transfer in the gas phase. It's very difficult to measure the gas phase all through the, the silver pipeline. So far, uh, we haven't, um, we have a few studies have been done, but it's no systematical ways that uh, you, to, to do the online monitoring. You have to rely on some modeling method to quantify uh, the methane emissions from the gravity solvers. Okay, um, in terms of the measurement, you can see that uh, this give you an example. So this is a dissolved methane uh, sensor that was applied at um, uh, about four kilometers silver uh, pipelines. This is a full-scale study in Gold Coast the city in Australia. So uh, in this three weeks measurement, you can see that the dissolved methane that they measure, this is in the rising main, all dissolved methane. Left one in the summer and then right, right ones in the winter. That we can see there are plenty of dissolved methane generated. And also in summer, you see higher methane than uh, winter. All right, in terms of the results, so n 2 emissions, there are uh, quite a few full-scale studies has been carried out worldwide. So this um, figure basically presented um, a summaration of the emission factors of N2O from the major configuration that are currently being used in, in full-scale treatment plant. So the first six are the, uh, the mainstream the mainstream, which is a low ammonium concentration between some 50 to less than 100 uh, milligram m per liter. And then the last one is the side stream. Side stream normally look at the, uh, the digest liquor stream. So you can see that in general, the low stream wastewater has a much lower emission factor than the side stream. Uh, the reason is side stream, you have a much higher nitrogen loading that you, uh, when you treat it, it you, you, you do have more like uh, factors that will affect the N2 emissions. Uh, so average, so this one mainstream is varied between zero uh, to, um, uh, to one point, I think less than per, uh, 2%. And then for the uh, side stream, it is much higher, I think, between 1% to 4%. And in terms of configuration, uh, well, based on this summary, SBR seems to be slightly higher than the rest of the configurations. Uh, but basically, I didn't say configuration really play a major role. It's more in terms of the operation that you are, operate, that you are operating uh, in this. So what I also need to point out, because many, sorry, so many studies because this is a summary study and the, these really depend on the monitoring period and how you actually quantify. So there are sometimes online missions, some of the studies actually using offline grab assembly, some use short, some use line, some use one hood, some use multiple hoods. So there are a lot of variations in terms of mission factors. 
Um, the next slide is basically a study that we have done uh, in Australia. Uh, though, so this is based on a step um, feed configuration. We did have like a three hoods in, in one of the uh, steps. So the basically two steps. So what I want the key message I want to show you here that you can see in each of the hoods that we did see there are different concentrations of N2O flux. So basically that along with the wastewater treatment, we see um, a, a huge spatial variations. And in the meantime, that some studies in Europe, they did see also um, huge variations in, in seasonal variations as well. Okay, um, the last two slides basically. Uh, I just, just a want few to more, Liu, right? A few more minutes then. Uh, Perfect. Yes, so I'll, I'll be very quickly, Amanda. So, um, so with methane emissions, I just want to uh, show you like uh, the methane emission really depend on whether you have or with or without uh, aeration, uh, sorry, without anaerobic treatment or with or without long term sludge. sludge. Uh, handling. Uh, so um, overall, the methane emission from treatment plant contributed between four to nine, uh, twenty percent. So it's less contribution uh, compared with how N2O contribute to the total carbon footprint. And also methane emissions from silver. The key point will be you can see that majority of these are carried carried out in the rising main. So we don't have too much has currently being done in the gravity silver yet. Uh, I think. Uh, very quickly. Uh, so these are main uh, move to the modeling. So there are a lot of work modeling kinetic benchmark, uh, the hybrid model integrated with uh, uh, machine learning. So later on, Jose will have more uh, slides introduced about the modeling uh, progress. So what I want to say there with all this modeling we have done that really um, advance us or assist us in terms Fundamental, fundamental understanding of the generation for these uh, greenhouse gases. And later on, it helps us to provide uh, or propose a mitigation strategy in terms of how we can uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions or mitigate emissions from that. Um, I think my last slide is all these, all these graphs are taken from the book. So I think if you have any of the questions that are asked there, you can go to um, the chapters find your answers. Thanks. I think that's all I want to talk. Thanks Sorry very much, you. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> um, really exciting to have the launch and, and to have a really rapid overview. Um, and the important thing to note is that um, we will have a focus masterclass on nitrous oxide and we'll also have a focus masterclass on methane. So those are happening on the 18th of May and the 22nd of June. And then we'll have a final one on taking action. Um, so there's lots, lots more there to, to learn. Um, and um, but yeah, great overview. And um, I'd now like to introduce Ariane Brotto. Um, so she's going to give us an overview of chapter four on greenhouse gas reporting guidelines. Ariane's um, a principal carbon and energy consultant with Jacobs, and she's got more than 10 years of experience in global academic, government, and consulting experience in environmental services and engineering. Her areas of expertise range from quantification and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions to delivery of energy management programs and innovation on resource recovery and circular economy. Ariane is currently working with key clients in Europe, advising on energy, carbon and circular economy strategies to support the achievement of sustainability and climate goals. In 2021, I'm proud to say that she was awarded the Siwem Young Environmentalist of the Year and um, she's called for chapter four. And um, over to you, Ariane. Thank you very much, Amanda. And sorry for my, for my voice, excuse me. I'm recovering for a sore throat, so I'll be keeping hydrated here during the presentation. I might need a few stops. Uh, but yeah, thank you for, for the opportunity. I'm really happy to be part of this book. Um, I, along with Amanda, we wrote chapter four and I'll be giving an overview, a quick overview because it, it's a big chapter and we only have um, a time slot here, but it, we will be focusing on the accounting methodologies and protocols supporting greenhouse gas emissions assessment and reporting that are relevant for the urban water system in wastewater. And Liu already gave some um, tips of what is happening on my presentation as well. So I'll try to cover that very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so <clears throat> we'll be covering the main points of the chapter and there's much more details there you can, that you can find yourself. Um, so we go uh, uh, through accounting methodologies and protocols supporting national assessment and reporting of greenhouse gas. This will be specifically for greenhouse gas emissions of relevance to the water system and 
talking about the different greenhouse gas emission scopes and the relevance in how they are, the boundaries are set uh, for water utilities. Um, and will be mainly based on the IPCC methodology for municipal emissions. And the focus here is process emissions. So we'll be talking about nitrous oxide and methane, how they are reported based on the IPCC, uh, both top-down and, and bottom-up approaches, including the latest um, update in 2019, the refinement of the IPCC. And we'll be talking briefly about some examples of application from the mark, but we're going to hear more details later on with our next, next speakers. Uh, next, please. So the global reporting of greenhouse gas emissions, it came to be as part of the UN uh, framework uh, convention on climate change in 1994. So it's been a while. And the, the goal was to seek to reduce emissions of greenhouse gas. And all the countries, the parties, um, they were required to develop, to update and publish their national emission inventories every year of six different greenhouse gas. And this is for the whole country, so every industry and the urban water sector is just a part of that. Um, and these inventories are made based on the IPCC, um, the International Panel on Climate Change uh, guidelines. And uh, these include nitrous oxide and methane from wastewater treatment as well. And in 2015, almost 20 years later, we had a, the historic agreement in Paris that we all know about. And to seek to limit the global temperature increase to well below two degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. And in this case, all these countries, these bodies, they are required to uh, maintain nationally determined contributions and disease um, for greenhouse gas emissions. So basically saying what what do they intend, what these countries, these parties intend to achieve in terms of reductions. And this must be reported every five years. Um, and so the 2006 IPCC guideline is basically the base for most of these um, uh, reporting for the, um, all the, the parties. Um, and in the urban water sector specifically, the methodology to estimate nitrous oxide, it first uh, came about in the 2006 um, IP, IPCC guideline, um, but there were limited uh, data back then, and we are going to, to give more details later on. And finally, in 2019, we had a refinement in, in Japan, um, and that's the, the main guideline that we use for the urban water sector. And for the first time, introduced a higher uh, tiered methodology for nitrous oxide that are, we will cover in more details here, and it's very detailed in the book. But this is basically what we're going to be talking about um, in the presentation. Next slide, please. But before we go into the reporting, um, we need to understand what these um, emissions are those and how we, we report them. And it's basically understanding the emission scopes and how they play a role in how we report. Um, so greenhouse gas emissions, they can be quantified and reported by countries, as I was talking about, but also by companies such as water utilities and organizations such as my company, Jacobs, um, by scope. And we have scope one, two, and three, and they are differentiated by scope one being direct emissions on site and process emissions are considered direct emissions. And there's also scope two and three, which are indirect emissions. Um, they were first introduced, so this nomenclature is not part of the IPCC guidelines. It's, it was introduced by the GHG protocol of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the WRI. And it's basically to categorize the ownership level of that emission. And we know we are talking here about the main um, greenhouse gas, sorry, it's misspelled here, but it's CO2, methane, and, and nitrous oxide. And at Lee we already covered um, where they emitted in the wastewater, so I'm not going through that. I just wanted to, to point out that we are going to have another MySecLise specifically on nitrous oxide uh, pathways 
and biotic and abiotic production. And to note that CO2, carbon dioxide, it's usually excluded from inventories from wastewater treatment because of the biogenic nature. However, um, there is an emerging issue with uh, non-biogenic CO2 emissions um, that occur from result of fossil carbon in manufacture of personal products, cleaning products that ends up in our uh, sewer system and wastewater treatment. These are currently not accounted for, but it's a matter of discussion and how to be included in the next IPCC. And what I want to highlight here, and this is um, the importance of boundaries and how you define your scopes, your scope one, two, and three, specifically for water utilities. If it's a, for instance, a municipal water company, um, they are publicly owned and associated with a city, for instance, their boundary will be a ge geographic boundary approach. So what they emit within the city boundaries. And in this case, um, everything that is emitted outside the city boundaries would be considered scope three, for instance. But, uh, and they will follow a specific protocol, the GHG protocol for cities. But if it's a regional water company, public or private that covers a large regional area, um, they will usually use a control approach, so either financially or operational control. So they will only report what they, they have control of. And in this case, scope three emissions will be, the value chain will be completely different from scope three emissions of a public municipal water utility. So it's important to characterize and have clarity of these boundaries for the water sector when we report emissions uh, inventories. Um, so we have consistency and a relevant uh, baseline for the ambitious uh, emission reductions that we, we are looking after. And this is all in very details in the book as well. Next, please. Um, so, <clears throat> The, I think one of the main points to discuss here is the, the two different approaches for accounting for process emissions. They are now part of the IPCC um, based on the 2019 refinement. They were not there back in 2006. And these are top-down and bottom-up um, approaches. And these basically, they are distinguished by how the data is obtained and the level of confidence. So for instance, um, top-down approach refers to an equation and the emissions are estimated based on factors and constants and they usually base on these constants and equations are based on global data or default data. So for instance here, um, how we calculate an emission rate, we have an emission factor times an activity data. So for nitrous oxide, for instance, we would be looking at the, on the basis of the prote protein content um, of the wastewater, so the nitrogen content, and to which extent this protein generate nitrous oxide, which is the emission factor, and so on and so forth. So we can uh, get emission factor from the IPCC, for instance, and the activity data from the H WHO um, in terms of the protein content. Um, so it's based on default values, it's not accurate, right? And on the same lines uh, for methane um, is the same, based on activity data will be the organic content, and then we have the um, emission factors as well. On the other hand, can you click the next place? I think it's an animation that, yeah. Uh, we have a bottom-up approach, and this is what Leo was showing, the different types of how we, we can monitor and measure um, greenhouse gas emissions direct at a facility level. And they are based on defined methodologies depending on the type of method that you're using. And for instance, this could be to develop an emission factor for facilities across a country and you develop one emission factor for that country instead of having a default global emission factor. Or another example uh, is monitoring a facility itself and reporting the emissions of that facility. So you'll not be using the equations, the top-down approach. And we'll cover this more in details on the next um, slides. Next, please. So as I was mentioning, the 2019 refinement came with this uh, three-tier approach for um, 
nitrous oxide emissions specifically, they were there before for methane, but for nitrous oxide is the first time that it's presented. And you, we see here from two one to three, is basically increasing the methodological complexity and data requirement. So it's a progression from one to three, and you increase in confidence um, and the accuracy of the the assessment. And is your your in general, it goes from um, using a default data to site measurement and data collection. Uh, we acknowledge that um, it may not be feasible to use higher tiers, especially tier three, which is direct uh, monitoring of a specific facility and reporting it. Uh, but that's the, the di directions, the direction that we should be going if we do want to understand emissions and mitigate to achieve um, our goals with the Paris Agreement. Um, so in more details, CO1, it's considered good practice. It's a top-down, so we use the, that equation that I mentioned before based on global um, values for emission factor and activity data. It's still considered good practice, especially for countries that have no data at all. Nothing has been measured in that country yet. <clears throat> Tier two, it's a good practice. It's to develop um, an emission factor for that country based on field measurements. Um, and we see an example of that in, from the mark um, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and we have more details of that as well from other countries in the book, such as Australia, uh, Austria, and, and so on. And tier three, which is the advanced method, and we are happy that it it was included in 2019 refinement because that's what we've been seeing through our research throughout these, these decades. Um, that is to look at plant specific emissions. And it is, we acknowledge it is only for countries with good data and advanced methodologies. And this will give more accurate measurement from, from each facility. So although tier three, the direct monitoring is now recognized by the IPCC as the most preferable option. We know that few water utilities have undertaken direct monitoring historically because most of the data available was for research uh, to investigate the pathways or the process conditions leading, leading to nitrous oxide and not necessarily as a part of a emission inventory. Next, please. So talking about tier one, I'm going to cover very briefly each tier for nitrous oxide and then go th uh, through methane. So the methodology, I think Liu covered a little bit about this, so I'm going to go quickly. So we, we had a huge change from the 2006 um, emission value to what we have today, uh, two orders of magnitude. And it was based on peer reviewed um, work and many of us authors of the, this book contributed to, to the IPCC 2019 refinement. However, even with the new uh, tier one emission factor, there are still challenges with it um, based on our recent analysis and, and um, other authors as well. Um, so it's still not that good <laughs> and more, more needs to be done, uh, which takes us to really looking into site quantification and measurement for better accuracy. Um, also want to point that there is emission factor for receiving waters as well. Uh, next, yeah, so this is basically just how the emission factor 1.6% was derived and it was based on linear regression of 29 full scale monitoring data sets, mainly in common suspended growth uh, treatment processes. Um, new and less common processes uh, were not included and this was intentional from the IPCC. Um, so many countries, <clears throat> for many countries, this emission factor does not apply at all because it, they have other type of treatments that are more relevant and it's from data from all around the road. But we see that here larger treatment plants that treats over 300,000 population equivalent is driving this linear regression um, giving this emission factor and this is not common for many countries so this is one of the challenges and also looking at how the unity um, if we should be reporting it in terms of nitrogen load or nitrogen remote. Okay, so quickly on methane. So methane, there's also many, there are also many different challenges, uh, different from nitrous oxide, but it's still challenges as well. Um, methane came since 1995 actually, so it's been reported in the water sector for, for longer. 
it's more known uh, methane from another big treatment than the nitrous oxide. But it's basically a sum of uh, the emissions from each treatment unit and what is recovered. And it's based on, on this equation here. I'm just, yeah, I'm not going through because we don't have much time, but I think it's important to say that it's based on the maximum, emissions are a function of the maximum methane production potential, which is this BO, um, B0, uh, which is the maximum amount of methane that can be produced based on the BOD and the methane correction factor, the MCF, and this is what is measured. So basically the emission factor is calculated, it's not measured as it is for nitrous oxide. And um, we didn't have a revision in 2019 for methane. Uh, it was based on those 14 um, full scale, actually for us what we, we, we did have. So it's based for 14 full scale measured methane and the emission factor is um, 0.018 kilograms of methane for BOD. And um, there's still a lot of limitation on these and significant variability. And it is recommended even by the IPCC more extensive monitoring and collection of data for methane. And from sludge, uh, the IPCC doesn't even attempt <laughs> to provide emission factor for individual, sor individual sources. So emissions uh, from a sludge from anaerobic digestion, for instance, is due to unintentional leakages as a result of pipe work, valve, tanks, and think roof leaks, so it's difficult to measure. But the IPCC gives a general estimation between zero and ten percent of the amount generated, and in the absence, choose five percent. In the work that we we did with the UK water industry here in the UK, we covered a few more uh, emissions that are not covered under the IPCC, and we are working with them to develop a good practice guide. And Master Class Three will cover more of that next. Um, so conclusion, I'm going to just go to the final two points. Tier two for accurate reporting, tier three to support us to mitigate. Um, it's good to have a global standardized approach, but if we want to see changes, we need to go through the higher tier methodologies. Next, please. Uh, how am I with time, Amanda? I think that, yeah, just um, probably need to skip through, through these ones um, and refer folks to the book we'll hear about we'll hear about Denmark soon yeah so the IPCC guideline it provides a good and uniform practice so it is good and um, we should follow it and all those countries all those 196 parties do so are using it some have specific methodology for their own countries for tier two approach for instance and it's as covered in the book but we do need other tiers to to be able to mitigate and and have a accurate baseline to start with. Um, some other considerations in terms of methane uh, that we do need more more measurements and the, because it would be very site specific and linked to to the operations of the plant specific, specifically for for methane. And the book will cover more on the quantification and modeling approaches um, of those and and mitigation as well. And I think there is one more slide on. Brilliant. No, no, Thanks I just very wanted much. To, yeah, you can mention about the SUBI group then. <laughs> um, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Ariane. Thank um, you, guys. Really great, great overview. Hard to summarise. Um, the good thing is we'll hear more about the, the approaches required for Tier 2 and Tier 3 um, throughout the Masterclass series. Um, but now I'd like to quickly pass on to Jose, who's going to cover briefly in his 15 minutes some of the key issues in um, quantification modelling and mitigation. Jose is founder and CEO of Cobalt Water Global has 20 years experience in drinking and wastewater modeling, model-based decision support, is an expert in AI techniques and an internationally recognized expert on measuring, modeling and mitigating wastewater nitrous oxide emissions. He's got an academic background in environmental engineering, is a licensed professional engineer in the state of New York and is chair of the Iowa Task Group on Greenhouse Gases. Thanks very much, um, Jose. Great to get, um, yeah, great to hear from you now and uh, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. So, I'll be presenting some of the key issues that we've identified in the book, uh, as well as some key issues that will need to be addressed as the guidance in the book is implemented in practice. But first I wanna share a bit about the motivation behind the book and the launching of the IWA Task Group on Greenhouse Gas Modeling, which was launched in 2010. And in 2010, 
uh, we were going through a paradigm shift towards sustainable urban water management and wanting to minimize environmental impact besides just in the water environment. And what's also interesting is that in 2010, there were really no drivers for greenhouse gas reduction. The people that were working on this were, were passionate about applying their knowledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also thought that th there was something we needed to do. And it's interesting because now we're officially in a climate crisis. <clears throat> we know this is something we have to do. But also at the time we were recognizing that our activities in the water sector were resulting in scope one emissions of nitrous oxide and methane and that there were tools in place to include the processes for mechanistically describing N2O and methane production and emissions from wastewater treatment and, and sewers. There was also a need to synthesize and coordinate the research on, in extending these tools, but ultimately we wanted to provide a guide for practitioners to be able to take climate action in the water sector. And I encourage everyone to read the, the foreword written by Sadir Murthy, uh, who does a very good job in um, explaining this motivation. And Sadir is actually one of the people who helped found the task group. So in the book, we break down the pathways for into production and emissions from wastewater treatment. And Leo went through the pathways. And we have a very good understanding at this point of how into is produced uh, through nitrification and denitrification. You know, there still might be some questions as, for example, exactly what role Comamax uh, plays. And, and as we get a better understanding of this, perhaps it'll help us better manage M2O. But what we've proven is that we can apply this knowledge to assess and model and mitigate M2O emissions today. And sure, we're, we'll, we'll be learning more, there's lots left to learn. But if you think about it, the activated sludge process is over 100 years old. And what we knew 100 years ago, is not nearly what we know today. But that didn't stop us from starting to use the activated sludge process. So the same needs to be true for N2O. And the authors in chapter two do an excellent job to break down the influencing factors and controllable, controllable process parameters. And this is really the heart of mitigating N2O emissions because the pathways are what they are. They don't change. And we can't change the bacteria's minds. If the right conditions exist, they will carry out the biochemical reactions to produce N2O. But what we can do is change the conditions in our favor so that we still meet our water quality goals, but also avoid and to O emissions. And these influencing factors or operational parameters have been directly linked to risk of nitrous oxide emissions through the research. And what we've done is leverage this knowledge and, and using knowledge-based AI techniques, develop the N2O risk model, which we presented in 2014 and is now actually the, the knowledge-based AI component of the N2O risk decision support system, which we're implementing at Cobalt Water Global. But what this does is it allows us to generate a dynamic risk score for each of the key operational parameters, which then allows us to easily identify control actions to reduce N2O emissions. If you have a framework for looking at each of the influencing factors, you have a framework for mitigation. The influencing factors and, and pathways don't change. What, what's different from site to site is the combination of these. But if you have a way of consistently looking at any combination and identify in each case why you have risk and what you can do to avoid it, then th this is the key to mitigation. So Leo did, did a great job explaining the methane production and sewers. And the key issue here is, as Leo alluded to is that methane emissions from sewers is not currently included in greenhouse gas emissions inventories. So we can no longer turn a blind eye to sewers and the methane emissions coming from sewers. We need to start looking at this and including this. 
because we can't be net zero if we're not doing anything about the methane emissions in sewers. Uh, another key issue that needs to be addressed is the use of the generic emission factors. As um, <clears throat> Ariane did a great job in summarizing uh, the, the protocols and the various tiers, but Vasilaki et al. had reported on the range of the N2O emissions from monitoring campaigns that have been reported in the literature. And this range is essentially 0.001% to 12% of the incoming total nitrogen load. So essentially what, what we're doing when we're using generic emission factors is picking one number of a possible 12,000 and saying that this is what the emissions are. And I think Jacobs did some additional work, Ariani and Amanda, in summarizing the results from this work and from which we, we saw that if you apply the 2019 IPCC emission factor, you'll be correct in estimating the emissions for a specific site one out of 10 times. So. 90% of the time, you will be wrong with the IPCC emission factor. Um, and Ariane explained that, that, that there are some challenges with this. And the main challenge is that it doesn't account for the site-specific conditions. Another issue that needs to be addressed is, is also the comparison of process types. And Liu mentioned that it, it's not necessarily the, the process type, it's really the operation. So this, this is key. What will be interesting to see as we uh, compare process types is comparing optimized sites for N2O versus optimized sites for N2O. And I think it'll be interesting to see what the, comparis the comparisons are then. So in terms of the full-scale quantification of N2O and methane emissions from water resource recovery facilities and, and sewers, we see that a, a key issue is that the measurements are difficult. We can't get around them, we have to do them because if we don't measure, we don't know what the emissions actually are. Uh, we can use modeling tools to, to make good estimates, but as we see with using only the emission factors, um, it's very challenging. So what has been suggested is tailored measurement campaigns to identify process parameters or performance indicators that can be monitored with less effort. <clears throat> and one thing that we're doing is, is using machine learning to do this as we, are collecting data from measurements, we can develop and train a machine learning model that we can then use as essentially a soft sensor. I guess the question is how long are these machine learning models good for after the initial training? And what we've seen is that they can be good for up to several months. Um, and then after which point we either replace it with a better model or go back and do more measurements to, to retrain it. <clears throat> For sewers, uh, as Leo mentioned, it's, it's difficult to be measuring for a whole network. So really need to be combining uh, some measurements in, in hotspots and, and modeling to be able to quantify the emissions from a sewer network. Uh, also, we've seen that the objectives for monitoring will dictate which approach you take and well, you mentioned there's the, the trace dispersion method, the off gas for floating hood method, measuring the off gas with an analyzer using a micro sensor, and also doing grab samples with GC analysis afterwards. And I've used each of, each of these uh, except for the trace dispersion method and can say that each has their own pluses and minuses. So it really depends. Uh, what your needs are, what your current situation is that, that will dictate what makes the most sense for you. We also see that the field measurements are also going to be very critical for verifying the reductions. So I guess a key question is, do we need to measure for 12 months? And from the research, we know that there can be seasonal variations over a 12 month period, but do we really need to see this? And I feel that we, we don't. If we're doing measurements, we should be mitigating. It seems kind of silly to be doing measurements and allow the emissions to continue to happen for a 12 month period after you start the measurements. And there's th some things that we can do. Obviously, we, we know that there's seasonal variation, so we can look at the historical data, take into account the site specific conditions, 
uh, and make some good uh, judgment as to how different the emissions can be during uh, different periods. Uh, we can also use uh, modeling, mechanistic modeling or machine learning to look at the historical data uh, and see how much the emissions can vary. But I think the most important thing is to be mitigating. Uh, so as soon as we are able to do uh, measurements to establish a, a baseline, we can then implement control actions to mitigate those emissions. So we have um, <clears throat> the, the modeling chapters uh, and specifically for modeling and 2 emissions from water resource recovery facilities. And we break down the model. So we have a series of denitrification models and uh, with varying complexity, as much as uh, accounting for electron competition and different approaches for doing this. And for the nitrification, uh, we have single pathway models for AOB, we have dual pathway models. So we have a, a, also a complete series of AOB pathway models. And what we've seen is that we can achieve a very accurate description and representation of the N2 emissions with these models. And what they also allow us to do is to really understand what's happening on a mechanistic level. And we also have uh, biofilm N2O models. And I think that these can play an important role because uh, when we're doing measurements, we can't really measure in the biofilm. It's, it's difficult to measure in the biofilm. So I think we can use the models to tell us what is happening in the different layers to then be able to use that information to identify control actions to reduce N2O emissions. But because um, the data has been limited for both the full scale and also, the, sorry, for the uh, suspended systems and the biofilm systems, uh, there's still some model calibration and validation work that can be done. Uh, but I think as we're collecting more data, we'll be able to do this. So uh, some of the key issues that have been identified with Two minutes, Jose. modeling, Thanks. okay, uh, is uh, that the, the application of these models and the calibration are not straightforward, but we now do have uh, good guidance on applying these. And I guess there's a question on whether we have a unified model. I think we can say we have uh, multiple unified models, and I think this is a testament to uh, the, I guess, the site-specific nature of N2O emissions. So different models might be better for different purposes. Uh, again, for the sewers, uh, we've seen that mechanistic model can help empirical models, which are easier to use. Uh, modeling methane oxidation in water resource recovery facilities is important for understanding possible methane emissions from the activated sludge process. But again, the biggest issue is that we, we can't ignore sewers anymore. It's a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. We also cover benchmarking. Uh, so there's been, there's been a, an extensive amount of work done in extending the BSM platform to be able to evaluate the greenhouse gas impacts of various control strategies. And this provides a really good framework for benchmarking, which can then be extended to looking at various facilities. This is also a good platform for testing models. As an alternative to the mechanistic modeling, we also cover knowledge-based and data-driven approaches. And here is an example that we have in the book from uh, the Eindhoven Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, from Water Board de Domo. And here we show how we can use the risk because we see that the risk correlates very closely with the measured M2O to then identify control actions. And we see how we can significantly reduce the N2O uh, when, when we implement these control actions. We see that also we see the process efficiency improve when we're mitigating N2O. Uh, but we also see uh, the use of data-driven approaches. That was the knowledge-based approach. But we can also use data-driven approaches and also to answer the question whether we need to mo uh, measure for 12 months. Uh, Vasilaki et al. have shown that we can significantly reduce this period by identifying uh, changes in the process where, uh, which would change the N2O emissions profile. But this is only happening under certain times, so we don't necessarily be, need to be monitoring 
uh, 24 seven <clears throat> over a whole year. And in the conclusions perspectives, we identify some additional key issues. So the emission factors, one step in the right direction is taking into account the performance uh, so looking at the nitrogen removed, and this is an improvement, but it's still not looking at the process and taking into account the site-specific conditions of the process. Because if we look at this example, which is, a, I guess, a, a, um, an example of the mitigation for the first site that implemented permanently into a mitigation actions, the total nitrogen before and after was very similar but the N2O was significantly lower. So it's not so much how much nitrogen you're removing, but how you're doing this, because there's a wrong way and a right way. Uh, but also monitoring, we cover the role of soft, sens soft sensors and digital twins as we move uh, into the digital age. And we summarize the mitigation um, and examples of mitigation actions. Uh, but again, these are site specific, but what's important here is the framework. But I think that the biggest issue and uh, the biggest take home message is that there's an urgency for taking climate action and the time to be quantifying, modeling and mitigating greenhouse gas emissions in the water sector is now. Again, just want to thank uh, the task group uh, for their contributions, uh, Liu and Ingmar and Amanda and all of the contributors um, and Amanda for organizing this masterclass series. And there is a, an, um, a bridged version of uh, acknowledgements to the task group and the supporters in the book, uh, but I'll be sharing an unabridged version. So I think uh, you'll find that there's a note at the end of the book acknowledging the, the members. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jose. Um, good to have that overview of key issues. Um, but as you say, we can act on these emissions today. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Per Henrik from BCS Denmark. He's as a project director, he serves as a focal point for development of optimization possibilities in BCS Denmark. This work has been focused in recent years on making major treatment facilities energy positive, preparing BCS Denmark for, for wastewater treatment of the future and very much focused around resource recovery and achieving carbon dioxide neutrality for the entire facility, um, as indeed um, many progressive Danish utilities are striving towards. Pear brings more than 30 years of experience leading and participating in multidisciplinary teams in, in a large number of sanitary infrastructure projects and general environmental projects and has a broad background, including work as a consultant and managerial roles within water utilities. Um, with that, I'd love to hand across to Pear for, for our next 15 minute slot. Um, we'll then have just a few minutes for questions, but the majority of these will also pick up in the next masterclasses. So please don't worry, we'll carry over any questions that we haven't got to um, uh, for the next, uh, the next three masterclasses. Thanks again for joining us today um, and over to you now. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just a few words about our utility. We're an old utility, the third largest in Denmark, uh, and we are operating a number of water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants covering both drinking water and wastewater. We have the Ivy Miller wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, around 400,000 PE, and, uh, and that's where we're doing a lot of our fun. We've been energy neutral since uh, 2019, not just at the wastewater treatment plant, but at the entire utility. We have a strong focus on implementing UN sustainability goals, and that gives us an opportunity to, uh, to be committed to innovation and development and uh, looking at, uh, at all the fun stuff and try to, to do better in the world. So next slide, please. I'm trying to, uh, to progress uh, fairly rapidly here because uh, uh, I think I'm a little bit behind on time. Uh, this is uh, just an energy produ production utility showing how, what we've been doing. Uh, we used to, uh, to consume more energy than what we're producing, but we have had a, a strong focus over the past uh, 10 years or more on, uh, on optimizing our production and, uh, and producing energy in the form of heat uh, to the district heating and electricity to the grid, uh, now in a, an amount that's uh, larger than our consumption as a utility. So it is possible for a utility to become energy neutral if uh, if if you have a possibility in the, to, co to coincide with your society. Next slide, please. On the uh, N2O and uh, on, on the methane, uh, were just a few uh, words about regulation. 
currently we are regulated on BOD, nitrogen and phosphorus, so we are paying a tax on that. Uh, and we expect future taxes on the CO2 emissions as well. Uh, we don't know the magnitude of those, but we know that it's going to cost our customers uh, some money. And hence, it's an opportunity for us to save money by reducing our discharge. Um, there will be a requirement for reduction of uh, nitrous oxide on plants, uh, more than 30,000 people equivalent. Um, and the goal is to decrease uh, about 50% of the emissions uh, by 2025. The methods are still quite unclear, so, uh, so we're working together with the Danish EPA to try to come up with measure, measurements and, uh, and, and schemes for how to optimize this. Uh, and it's quite unclear where the reference point is uh, right now. So, uh, so uh, we are, are trying not to be caught in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a wrong place where, where we are, have already reduced our emissions and then are being forced to reduce even more uh, if it's possible at all. We've already done quite a lot at, at our facility. Uh, and on the, uh, on the methane, uh, preliminary, preliminary data shows that we are losing about between 2 and 7%, uh, and that will be regulated in the Danish context as, as well very soon. Uh, so we are looking into regulations in Denmark for, for minimizing the emissions, and, uh, and that will drive uh, uh, development and uh, innovation to, uh, to, minimize, uh, to achieve these goals. Next slide, please. There was a, a, a reference to what we are doing in Denmark, and uh, we have this tier two, and uh, that was based on, on eight or nine wastewater treatment plants where we had a lot of data collection uh, for, uh, for a, a longer period of time. And based on that, uh, it was decided that the Danish factor will be 0.85% uh, uh, in, instead of the IPCC factors. Uh, so, so in Denmark, we've decided on a, on, on a factor uh, based on measurements uh, from a number of wastewater treatment plants. There's a couple of difficulties. Uh, some of the wastewater treatment plants in Denmark are, are aerated by surface aerators, and, uh, and finding an emission factor for surface aerating, uh, aer aerated wastewater treatment plants is, is really, really difficult. And, uh, and uh, we are looking into finding new methods to, uh, to address that as well. But the factor in Denmark right now is 0.84%. Uh, Next slide, please. We made our own evaluation at the, our wastewater treatment plant. Um, and uh, we can see here a, a little bit of a, the dilemma. Depending on how we calculate the, the, uh, the uh, emission, based on two different methods, we get very uh, different results uh, from uh, uh, if we use power consumption or observed uh, oxygen concentrations uh, and, and with the KLA. So, so we're still a little bit uh, frustrated by the fact that we cannot measure it very correctly. And therefore we are looking into the possibility of, of finding new methods. This evaluation here was, uh, did cover the membrane aerated biofilm reactor as well. Uh, as a solution which we have tested. So next slide, please. And we, uh, we have uh, at the Ivy Müller uh, wastewater facility uh, uh, tested membrane aer aerated biofilm reactors. And uh, for an extended period of time, we've tried with a couple of reactors, uh, different loading uh, schemes, and a lot of, lots of operational data, uh, data have been, been used to verify this. And it, it very much indicates that uh, uh, we can lower the N2O emissions by uh, 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 quite a, a bit, uh, quite substantially, uh, if we uh, if we use membrane area the biofilm reactor. And we are actually looking to uh, to put that into one of our smaller wastewater treatment plants right now to see if we can uh, if we can mitigate some of the uh, and reduce some of the uh, uh, emissions. And that's, of course, uh, in a biofilm system where you have a very short uh, sludge retention time and hydraulic re retention time. So we can, we, can get, uh, we can get two benefits here, a, a very low footprint and a very low uh, nitrous oxide emission factor. Next slide, please. Another... Another project that we're running right now, uh, the RS project, uh, the project goal is to reduce uh, emissions from wastewater 
We are addressing methane and nitrous oxide, of course, and it's supported by the Danish EPA. It's a cooperation with uh, a number of utilities in Denmark, uh, the bigger utilities, uh, the EPA and, uh, and a couple of universities and a consultant. Uh, we are looking at, uh, in this project, to, uh, to make a new advanced sludge handling system, advanced measurements uh, at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, uh, like uh, the one uh, Liu was, uh, was talking about earlier with the, with the trace gas, uh, measurements in the, in the sewer system to, to find hotspots uh, in the sewer system and pilot testing to enhance control strategies to minimize uh, the, uh, the N2O emission. And we're trying a new online measurement uh, with, with nitrite instead of to, to see if that's a, a possibility to, to bet, get better control of nitrous oxide. Next slide, please. And finding the emission, that is really the big problem in practice. I mean, uh, we have a number of places where we, can, where we have emissions from and, and pinpointing that and making accurate uh, uh, meth, uh, metering uh, out on wastewater treatment plant is really a, a, a problem. We're using the trace gas and we're using uh, uh, online measurements uh, in uh, dissolved uh, uh, in, in the fluid as well to, uh, to see if we can make correlations, but it is really difficult and we find new places where we, uh, where we get these emissions from, uh, especially methane is, is a little bit of a, a trick. So, uh, so finding the emission and, uh, and controlling it is uh, rather difficult. Next slide, please. On the lower picture, you can see a, a, a evaluation made by the car on the upper picture where, where we uh, have a trace gas, uh, trace gas measurement. And as you can see, the, the blue plume there in the middle is from the, uh, from the uh, digestion system. And of course, we, we, we get quite a lot of methane there from, from slip. But we do find other places around the wastewater treatment plant where we have unexpected emissions. And, uh, and that is something we need to address in the future as well. Uh, the same goes for the, uh, for the sewer system where we can uh, find hotspots in some places and, and in other places where we would have expected methane emissions we find nothing. So it's still, there's still quite a lot of work to do before we have a, a, a good picture of where we, uh, where we have to do something in practice to reduce the, the emissions. Next slide, please. On reduction of, of methane, we have uh, just, uh, we're just installing a new covered uh, sludge storage facility. And a lot of places around the world, uh, sludge storage facilities after digestion uh, uh, open, uh, open tanks and uh, there will be a rather large amount of, of methane emissions from there. Uh, so we're, we're covering it and, uh, and, and taking the gas back to the gas engine and the, the gas holding tanks. Uh, and at the same time, we're introducing a vacuum system to try to get the dissolved uh, methane out of the, uh, of the digested uh, uh, sludge to see where, what, to what level we can reduce the, the methane, methane slip from the wastewater treatment plant. So instead of having 7%, seven we hope we can reduce it down to a very few percent. Uh, it's probably not possible to get down to zero. There will be, from the cogen units, uh, there will be a, a slight methane slip and there will be some leaks uh, in, in a system uh, traditionally. So, so we are trying to find new methods to, to find the hole in the petrol tank uh, uh, and try to, to, uh, to minimize the, the methane slip. Next slide, please. We're running a pilot testing, uh, and that's one of our colleagues in, in Aarhus that are doing that, where they are trying to come up with new uh, process uh, control facilities and process combinations uh, to minimize the, uh, the uh, production and the emission of uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, both uh, conventional activated sludge and granular systems are tested and we are seeing very promising results right now where we can uh, potentially uh, have better control of, of, our, of our nitrification and denitrification and, uh, and by, by having a better control, potentially reduce the emission uh, quite dramatically. Next slide, please. Another project that we are running right now is NACAT. What if you can't do anything about uh, the uh, formation of nitrous uh, oxide? Why not just put it through a catalytical process uh, and, uh, and get rid of it? 
So a little bit like on your car, uh, have, putting a, a catalytical converter on, uh, on, on the exhaust from, from the wastewater treatment plant. That's, uh, that's what we're trying right now. Uh, it, uh, it might not be sustainable, but uh, from, uh, because there's a lot of air that needs to be heated up to, to be able to be converted, the, the nitrous oxide being converted in, in, the, in the catalytical process. But from specific uh, places like deammonification plants, where we see a rather significant emission, it might be a possibility. So we're very much looking forward to, to testing this, uh, this process and to see if we can't do anything uh, about the formation of nitrous oxide, at least we can, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, turn that into uh, free nitrogen uh, via a catalytical process. On the nitrous oxide side, we've been working for more than, uh, than uh, 10 years uh, uh, and, and we are still puzzled by what, what to do about it. We have been very active in developing a, of the liquid online sensor and we are seeing regulations coming in uh, force pretty soon in Denmark. So we really need to, to do something uh, on, on this. And uh, with regulation, there will be a very strong push for, for more, uh, more innovation and more research into how we can uh, minimize the emissions. Deammonification processes are really a challenge. We, we put a uh, deammonification in, uh, process into uh, Ivy Miller wastewater treatment plant some six, eight years ago. I think we would probably re-evaluate our, uh, our this decision uh, if we knew how much uh, nitrous oxide uh, that were produced uh, by having this deammonification. So we really need to do something. We have found met methods uh, to minimize it, but it's still a, a rather sub substantial emission. It's still very difficult to measure, if not impossible. So, so modeling and, uh, and uh, goes hand in hand with, uh, with measurements. And methane, of course, is the, uh, the, the big problem uh, that has been oversighted for, for many years. On the sustainability side, uh, there was a big push to, some 12 years ago, starting 12 years ago in, in, uh, in our utility. We were very focused on energy production and uh, as I indicated, we, we are producing a lot of energy and not using a lot. So, but that's looking at scope one and two. And now and in the future, we will be looking at scope three and, uh, and be looking much more carefully in, in what resources we are using. Uh, we are not... Uh, CO2 neutral by any stretch of the imagination due to all the emissions of uh, methane and nitrous oxide. But when we get control of that and uh, get a handle on that, uh, I, I think we can get a lot, lot closer. We're using life cycle analysis uh, evaluation and tools, and uh, we see that as a, as a very important part of, uh, of what, uh, how we can address these issues in the future. And, uh, and we're working on, on uh, absolute sustainability to see how much room do we actually, can we actually take in, uh, in society for our, uh, our, our interaction and, and, uh, and emissions. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I know I rushed a little bit, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, Per. No, that was fantastic. And um, yeah, our, our apologies for crowding you out a little bit. Actually, um, one of the questions that just, just came up was, um, I think you, you mentioned, um, I mean, there, there is a likelihood of the tax actually being on nitrous oxide and methane emissions. Is that correct? It's not just CO2 emissions from electricity use, for example. No, it will, it will be on, uh, on N2O and on methane. Uh, there will be regulations on methane and will be... Uh, uh, be penalized if we don't do anything about the, the, uh, the unwanted emissions of, of, of methane. That might come in force later this year already, uh, but the N2O taxation will be uh, enforced by 2025. Brilliant. Thanks. And I'd just like to recognize the progressive work that you know, you're doing to actually take action on these emissions. Um, and also, I think the progressive work of, of, of Denmark generally, um, this is absolutely what we need to be doing. Um, so we'll hear more from VCS Denmark, as well as some other leading utilities across the next three masterclasses. Um, I think, actually, given we've run out of time, it's a, a good thing to say that we've, I think, dealt with most of the questions. Um, we've got our two poll results up right now, which show that um, we're from a range of different places um, and very much in a, a learning mode um, and looking forward to taking action on these process emissions.
But I think with that, um, we've, we've come up to time. We've had some great presentations. The next three masterclasses will really dive into some of the, these issues in more detail. Um, any questions that we haven't answered, we will, um, we will pick up in the, in the series going forward. Um, and I think I'd just really like to say um, what an honour it is to be on this panel with, um, with some real leaders in this field in terms of um, process emissions um, and, and on such a critical topic. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. Um, if we could just maybe flick through the next few slides, um, just to remind folks of um, an upcoming, the upcoming I were thing. So we've got industrial water coming up. Um, just as a reminder, next one, thanks. We've got the World Water Congress, which will be brilliant. Definitely some, um, must, uh, some workshops and process submissions there, I believe. And um, finally, uh, please join IWA and, get, and be, become part of our communities of practice and um, greenhouse gas action groups um, and, and the opportunities to contribute to, you know, to events like this and, and to the important work of mitigating these emissions. There's a discount code there as well. And with that, I think, thank you very much. A huge thank you to the panelists um, today. And thank you very much for joining us. And um, we really hope you can join us on the 18th of May for the next masterclass. This will be on nitrous oxide. In the meantime, um, your homework, of course, is to, um, is to read the book and um, um, come with your questions. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you very much again. And a, a huge thank you to the team at Iowa for organizing and supporting us in, in hosting this and also recognizing the Institute of Chemical Engineers who've also um, co-supported the webinars through their water special interest group.